prepared to go to God's word, God was telling me in the office that we're in a season where hearing is very important. Those that have an ear need to hear what, what God is saying. There's a lot of stuff being taught to us and we'll probably deal with some of that in the message, but our hearing is very important. And I've always been this way, but now in these last days, um, more so than ever, um, I'm not really concerned about if we shout over a message each week. I'm not really concerned if you tell me if I preach the good word. My focus is, did you hear anything? Because it's important what you hear in these last days because what you hear is gonna determine how you respond and how you react to what you're hearing and what's going on around you. So while it's nice to hear about great messages and preaching and things like that, um, we need to be hearing and we need to watch what we listen to. So my prayer is each week as I, as I stand before you, always very well prepared, even though I always think I could do a little better. Um, my purpose each week is that I would allow you to hear from the heart of God, as the prophets would do, and, and the voice of God, that it would just be something that bounces off your eardrums, but that it would be something that you would greatly consider and say that this is a word from the Lord. Amen? Amen. Colossians chapter 2. going to learn today. Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 7. You know, it's funny as a preacher, if you're a preacher like me, there are those that are like me that are just on your grind as it relates to sermons and really trying to give people the meat of God's word and what they need. Sometimes there's a temptation to not do all that, just come out here and say whatever because it seems like everybody else is doing it and the people seem to actually be, actually enjoy it. They shout about it and get excited about it. And you almost say to yourself, why should I work this hard when this seems to be what the people are excited about? But I don't preach for your excitement. In fact, that the word delivers you, you should get excited about that. I, I, sh I shouldn't shout you before you get delivered first. Because you'll shout one minute and be crying the next. But I should preach for your deliverance and it may hurt and you may cry for a while, but you'll come out shouting and you won't stop shouting. So if I don't preach to your excitement each week, you're going to have to take that up with God because my responsibility is to feed the flock of God give you sweets, but feed the flock of God. I'm feeling very pastoral today, so. Uh, Colossians 2, 6 through 7, and we're in the second part of our um, series, Stronger. Uh, if you have your Bible, say amen. So then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Some of your Bibles say, walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Strengthen in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Once again, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Once again, I want to preach the second part of this stronger series with the title Strengthened in the Faith. Strengthened in the faith and take your seat. That song kind of tore me up a little bit. I'm gonna fight tears and preach at the same time. Amen. I believe that when you start talking about spiritual strength and the idea of getting stronger, that you must also talk about faith because there is a direct correlation. In fact, most people have prayed a prayer where they said, I just need my faith to be stronger so I can get through this tough time. I, I just got to continue to believe so I can hold out till God comes to see about me. You ever had a prayer like that? Lord, don't let me lose faith because if I lose faith, then it's all over with. Then sometimes the prayers go into, Lord, give me the strength to keep it all together. 
Help me to stay strong and not give in to that temptation. God, just keep me. I don't know what my mind is doing. My motives are starting to look a little shady. I'm entertaining things that I had resisted for some time. My prayer is just, God, just keep me. And we pray like this because we understand that God is our strength. He is strength for us and he is strength in us. But we must also understand that we access that strength and that grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So when our faith is what we are declaring we are holding on to, then we are essentially saying that we are holding on to the truth or the unwavering conviction that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he not only died for our sins, but that he rose on the third day with all power in his hands. So the object of our faith is real and our hope is sure. So to stand on our faith and to keep the faith and to operate in great faith is to stand on Christ, to have Christ and to operate in the power of Christ. So now when we consider what we are facing and how we overcome obstacles and the ability we have to keep standing while others are throwing in the towel, well, yes, it is through the strength of God and, and that we made it, but it is by faith. And the Bible declares that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So we've already overcome as an eternal verdict. But while we are going through in the natural, it is by faith that the supernatural strength of God is activated. And it allows for the opportunity of a demonstration of his power in us, through us, and around us. Which means faith is essential for us and our ability to handle the challenges of life. Notice when Jesus walked the earth, he was power. Jesus was deliverer. He was healer. He was restorer. He was love manifested right there before the people. He was the strength they needed and they had him right there. But if they were to access who he was and what he had, they had to have faith. They had to believe in who he was and that he was the one sent from his father in heaven. And it was that faith that made the difference in their lives. Jesus tells Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. Jesus tells the woman with the issue of blood, your faith has healed you. Jesus tells the leopard that returns, stand up and go, your faith has made you well. Jesus said this about the centurion whose slave was sick. Not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Now in these cases, these people did not have Jesus like we do by way of the Holy Spirit. But they took a faith step and believed on him. And he healed them or saved them. And the hope would be that they wouldn't stop believing. Well, by grace through faith, we have Jesus living in us through a single act. However, because the just live by faith, there should be continual actions of surrender, commitment, and discipline so that we are strengthened or established in our faith. Yes, your faith makes you, watch this, but the life of faith molds you in the image of Christ. And you don't want to be made and not molded. You don't want to be healed and not delivered. You don't want to have a breakthrough and not be broken. You don't want to be brought in by the word of truth and then sell out to false doctrines and itchy ear presentations, false truths and man's knowledge. Faith has got to be more than that to you. Because we've got to understand that our first faith, watch this, is not the fulfillment of our faith. Our first faith is not the fulfillment of our faith. Because our initial commitment is only the beginning of a progressively fuller commitment to Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's Ephesians 4, 13. So while faith has brought us into a relationship with Christ, the same faith should build a stronger relationship with Christ where nothing can move us or sway us into believing something different than what we first received. Y'all with me? And now this is the premise in which Paul writes to the Colossian church. He is writing to these saints, these believers that heard the word of God and have manifested fruit of the word of God in their midst. But their faith is under attack because of false teachers in the church. Now for the most part, Epaphras bought bought Paul good news about the Colossian church. He tells of their faith in Christ and their love of the saints. 
the Christian fruit that they are producing, their love in the spirit and their order and steadfastness in the faith. But there was also, now we're learning today, but there was also heresy in the church that was brought to Paul's attention, which means a belief that is contrary to or against an established belief, in this case, Christianity, heresy. So some of the characteristics were attacks on the adequacy and supremacy of Christ. There were some elements of astrology and the worship of the stars in the moon. We see that stuff today. There was a fear that this church was falling back into elementary Christianity instead of leaning forward to maturity. In other words, the first things or the ABCs of Christianity, which are fine when you're starting out. But after a while, you ought to have a mature faith so that you're not being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. There was a focus on elemental spirits and demonic spirits and intermediaries between God and man. And these false teachers taught that it would take more than Christ to defeat demons and release men of elemental forces and demonic power. Some of y'all heard this for the first time. There were philosophical elements in which these teachers taught that more elaborate knowledge was needed to be added to the gospel. And they go on to observance of days and new moons and legalistic teachings and ordinances to limit the freedom one has in Christ Jesus. The worship of angels was also an issue. These teachings were more than likely a form of Gnosticism. That's your other word for the day. Gnosticism, which comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Though there are different variations of this doctrine, the general teaching was that salvation is achieved through special knowledge, and this knowledge is given to a special group that claim to have higher wisdom. So the issue for this church is that this teaching had the ability to influence them to seek for more than what they've been taught and never build on their first foundation. I'm going somewhere. So they would ultimately, ultimately be leaving their foundation in Christ for another foundation. So Paul, with intentionality, writes to them and stresses certain words in this letter to show that Christ is the head. He repeatedly uses phrases like, in him, he has, he is, by him and through him, and then points to him as the source of all knowledge, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. Because Paul understands that they already have everything that they need in Christ. But he needs them to understand this and grab hold of this truth before false truth metastasizes throughout the church. Paul rightly intervenes, here's your next word, as a polemicist. P-O-L-E-M-I-C-I-S-T. He intervenes as a polemicist, meaning he takes the stance of a polemic, which is one who contends or argues the truth of Christ against those within the church to prove the falsity of the contrary position. This is different from his normal position as an apologist. That's your other word, A-P-O-L-O-G-I-S-T, an apologist in which he would present a rational basis for the Christian faith. Where like the Bible would tell us, he would reason the scriptures, thereby defending the faith against objectors outside the church. So polemicists offend or defend in the church, and apologists defend outside the church. And everyone in here is an apologist, in case you didn't know that. I'm a teach. So he was dealing with an internal problem while it was still manageable so that it wouldn't become an epidemic and eventually tear up the foundation that was already laid for these believers. Because as I heard one preacher state, anytime there is false teaching, there is false living. So you've got to eradicate the false teaching to remove the opportunity to live wrongly and against the will of God so that the truth can be the standard in how we govern our lives. Notice Paul doesn't just feel that because they have the truth, they'll be okay or that things will just be fine. Yeah. And I say this because many of us would like to believe that because God's truth prevails over all, when a threat arises, then you just stand on his word no matter what, as if it's some easy thing to do. I'm not saying that's the wrong answer. But standing on God's word takes a level of strength that can only be obtained by developing in our faith while at the same time defending our faith. 
Because the reality is we heard something first. Then we processed it in our mind. And after we considered it all, made a choice to believe on Christ and our life in Christ is nothing but a journey of choices. Which means it's equally possible to turn around and hear something else to process it in our mind and consider that too. And depending on what choices are presented and how interesting the information sounds to us, we aren't always strong enough to choose rightly and discern what the perfect and acceptable will of God is. I know I'm preaching, you don't have to say amen. So to narrow down the choices and make it easier for us while we're still trying to mature in God, we've got to eliminate certain choices quickly and harshly so that we are not tempted to entertain them and we can set our focus on the things of God. But we've got to be careful with what society is offering us, what social media is both subliminally and outwardly trying to convince us is okay when we know that it's against God's word. We can't allow ourselves to be educated by shows that make demonic and astrological symbols look like decorations when they're really luring us into worshiping the devil. We can't allow ourselves to be influenced by shows that make fornication okay as long as you love the person and same-sex relationships and marriage is legitimate. We can't allow ourselves to be indoctrinated with the man's science behind why things are the way they are and the scientific breakthroughs they feel they have to prove there is no God and that Jesus really didn't rise from the grave. These are the types of things that you don't play with. You don't say, well, let me just hear their explanation. You don't dumb down all that Christ has already revealed to you to see if it's possible, if there's something else out there that you're missing. Because the truth is, you said yes to Christ because you were tired of trying things. You were tired of hearing things and you were tired of entertaining things. So now that you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good and that his truth prevails and that wisdom and knowledge and understanding comes from him, you need to go back to what you first believed. What you first believe. Our views keep changing and evidence to disprove God's word keeps being re-edited. God still remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So if you're going to hold on to something, hold to God and stand on his word. Because I hear God saying, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word, my word shall never pass away. Well, this church made the right choice. They had received God's word, and Paul confirms this when he says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, verse 6. But now with their initial choice, they needed to keep choosing Christ. Because after all, <laughs> Christ chose them to gift himself to. And we all here today are the chosen as well. Y'all get in this class today. As one writer notes, Christ is the gift of God to all of humanity. But Christians are those that have received the gift. While the gift is free and wasn't obtained on any merit of our own, the gift of Christ comes with responsibility. It is a privilege that comes with a duty, which means to have him is to know him, is to understand him, is to walk in concert with him, is to do his will. It's not just enough to say, I got him, but we must live in such a way that shows him that he got us. That's good preaching right there. That shows the world that he is in us, that God is not dead, but he's alive. And my life is a testimony of the living, not dead, the living power of God. So Paul goes on to say, since we have Christ, we should walk in or live in him. The statement means to make one's way, to progress, to make due use of opportunities, to regulate one's life, to conduct oneself. Paul says, since you have received Christ, make your way forward in him. You should progress in him. He says, rely on Christ as the regulator and as the conductor of your life. That's good. 
In, in other words, you should have such an awareness and consciousness of his presence that anything or anyone that would break your focus and cause you to lose sight of who Christ is should be dealt with. Yeah. Now the truth is, you won't progress in Christ without process. Because it's process that refines you and reveals what God has placed in you. Which is important because you can't just read about what you have, but you need to have experience with who's inside of you so that you know what you're working with and what it takes to get to the next level. That's why you shouldn't get bent out of shape when you're trying to go higher in God while at the same time getting poked, persecuted, and prodded by the world and the enemy. Watch this because when they press you, it touches an area inside of you that needs the opportunity to be exercised so that you know that you have it to work it and you can defeat the opposition on your way to your destiny. You didn't know how much patience you had till you kept being in seasons of waiting on God. You didn't know how much love you could give till you kept getting hurt by people. You didn't realize how much joy was in you till God kept allowing things and relationships you put before him to go bad and you found yourself with just you and God. And you soon realize that you're alright. That you're better and your joy isn't something that the world can give, nor can the world, y'all got it, take it away. So, now because you realize what you have, you don't buck against process, because process is helping you upgrade in progress. Y'all got it? And, and at every level, you've learned more how to let the God in you regulate your movements, what you say, how you react, what you watch, what you listen to, who you hang around. Because you've learned dependency on Him, and total dependency on God is a faith life. A fear life depends on self. But a faith life says whatever God says, whatever he wills, that's what I'm standing on. So we've got to, am I in the Bible? So we've got to live our lives in him. Because how we live our lives in him strengthens us in the faith. And Paul says this is how do we get strengthened in faith. We're walking in him. He said we have to be rooted planted in Christ. We've got to be rooted. Paul says it's not just enough to live in Christ and to be strengthened in faith. We must be rooted in Christ. The word used for rooted is the word which would be used of a tree with its roots deep in the soil. For it is in the soil that the tree gets its nourishment in which with nourishment comes strength. But the soil is also the place that holds the tree firmly in place. The deeper the roots, the more secure they are. So Paul says to live in Christ, we must go deep. He, he says, lock in securely with Christ and allow him to nourish us through his word, through prayer and other disciplines that allow us to continue to dig our roots deeper in Christ. We need to be saturated with his word. We need to sense that God is pouring into us and penetrating those deep areas. The tough spots. Anybody got any tough spots? Yeah, y'all, yeah, y'all, man, y'all in heaven. Tough spots and the rough patches to make us better and stronger and wiser and more productive in the kingdom. When we are deeply rooted in Christ. We're taking the effort to take a firm hold of him, who is the only one who can hold us up. It's never a matter if God's got us, but the question is, do you got him? Are you holding on for dear life? Have you come to the realization that he is your life, so you must hold on to him? Because if you're holding on to God, as you progress in God, anything trying to hold on to you or trying to push you off the path is going to eventually let go or give up. Because Jesus paid a high price for you and he's not letting go of you that easy. So don't let go of him. Stay rooted. Because the soil is the source of your strength and your power to overcome. 
See, so many of us, there's so many that are willing to entertain the next best thing, are inclined to do so, not because they aren't in Christ, but they aren't rooted. And when you aren't rooted, watch this, you can be standing on truth and jump over to a lie and then hop on over to deception because you haven't decided where you're going to lay down your roots. Now, now, I, I know you're saying that you decided, you decided already when you said yes to Christ. But digging deep roots takes daily decisions for Christ, not just your first decision. I love Jesus. I love you. I want to say yes to you. 1999, 2014, you're still doing the same old stuff. Not your first decision, but it takes more decisions for Christ to where you are so intent on feeding yourself with the things of God and de-weeding yourself of what is not Him. And it won't matter how greener the grass looks on the other side because your discernment will tell you it's only that green because you know what is over there. I got the witnesses in, in, in the building that you tried the other side. You thought it was going to be better and you realized how funky it was and you realize why because ain't nothing but a bunch of y'all know it. Yeah, I, I don't cuss, but you need your imagination. You need your imagination. Uh, that God is feeding your roots and he never told you that it will be green all the time but he did say that I will never leave you or forsake you so if I'm rooted in Christ I can stand brown grass as long as he's there because he's the same God that can make it green anytime that he wants you gotta declare I'll stick with God when it's sunshine and I'll stick with God when it's rain because not only am I rooted in him, but he's the one holding me up. Mm. Mm. Well, he said we just can't be rooted, planted in Christ, but he said built up, progressing in Christ. The word used for built up is the word which would be used of a house erected on a firm foundation. Paul says that we are walking in Christ. There is a full measure, a stature that the great architect of the universe has ordained for us in which our lives should be progressing upward to attain. He says, yes, we need to stand firm, rooted, but we've got to stand tall, built up. And indeed, in fact, the firmer our stance, the more we develop because it's what Christ gives to us that forms his person in us so that we grow up into him who is the head. Our foundation is fine, but we didn't receive Christ to stay where we are. He's trying to grow us and build us that we may stand as pillars of faith in our homes, in our communities, in our jobs, and in our churches. Now, in order to be built up in Christ means we've got to change the way we've been building. Uh, yeah, who's that uh, discernment, discernment. We, we've got to change the way we've been building. If we built our hopes on people and things, built our trust on the government, built our lives on the material and earthly possession, then we've now got to build on the one thing or person that would never perish, fade, or get old, and that one person is me. Our hope must be built on Christ. Our lives must be built on Christ. Our pursuits must be built on Christ. And this essentially is how we get built up in him. It's hard to not be built up in Christ when you're building on him because he's safe. He's sure. He has sustaining power. He has the power to add to you. And you need all of that because normally when something is being built, there are always forces working against it. I ain't got no witnesses in here. Normally, Dali's just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she rubbed her arm, mm -hmm, baby. Yeah. When, when anytime something's being built, there's always forces. I like being up here, I see it all. There's always forces working against it. And that was what was happening in this church. They were being built up, and there were internal forces trying to tear it down. When a new house is being built, there are times where construction has to cease or stop because of the weather. But the reality is, if they are built properly, 
once the bad weather is over, they just pick up where they left off and the house is just as strong. And as they do more work, it gets stronger. And that's the life of one who was built up in Christ. It's a life of building while taking a beating. You know, like that. I can tell you you'd say amen. It's the life of building. You, you, you saying I saw the smirk. It's the life of building while at the same time taking a beating. We can't control the storms of life, but we can control how we build. That's a shout right there. Yeah, you, you can't do anything about that. Lord, pray it away. Rain, rain, go away. Please come back another day. And it will come back another day. So you better build properly. We can't control them storms, but we can control how we build. And if we build properly, then we can withstand the storms and not get weaker having to go backwards and rebuild over again. But we can come out stronger because we've been tested and now we know what we can endure. Yeah. And then we can continue to build so that next time the enemy is going to have to try harder to take us down. But he won't be able to take you down because now you know how to be strengthened in the faith. You know your faith isn't something you just talk about, but it's something that you have to work on. Because you recognize as your faith gets stronger, you are getting stronger. And when the enemy tests your faith, he's also testing your strength. Well, if you're planted in Christ and you're progressing in Christ, then this test is nothing more than an opportunity for you to show the enemy where you stand and how firm you stand. And the first place you stand is over him because he's already under your feet and if he's under your feet that means that you already have the victory and if you already have the victory then you need to give God an already <laughs> be rooted built up strengthened in the faith established in the faith but why should we give him praise and he just adds a little part in there, abounding in it with thanksgiving, <laughs> praising Christ. You're just not planted in Christ and progressing in Christ, but should be praising Christ. William Barclay says that the distinguish, distinguishing mark of the true church is an abounding and overflowing gratitude. And that thanksgiving is the constant and characteristic note of the Christian life. Paul says that we should be overflowing with thankfulness. Walking in Christ is not just a firm stance or a tall stance, but it's a victorious stance. It's not looking for victory or expecting triumph, but we have victory because of what Jesus did for us. And the fact that we have received him gives us a reason to give unmeasurable things to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't say measurable. See, I can measure that right there. If I put that on the meter, I can measure that right there. God says very low. I said unmeasurable thanksgiving to God. I mean, take the roof off this church, thanksgiving to God. Let stop cars in the street, thanksgiving to God. What's that noise going on in Wissing? Thanksgiving to God. Because you already have the victory. If they hear the victory in here, they it's thankfulness and praise that is not withheld because of the process. Uh, remember I said process is part of the progress, but when process doesn't look right to us, we act like we can't be thankful. But everybody here can agree you're not in the same place in your progress as you were before, which means the process must be working. So you ought to give thanks in the process regardless of what the process looks like. Because when I look around the room, everyone has progressed. Huh. It's not something withheld because of slow progress. It's something that should be given without hesitation. That should be in normal unction just because I'm establishing the faith and I just want to say thank you. We're only here because of purpose. God revealed himself for that and died for that and as those walking in him or living in him we ought to be thankful. Our praise is a sign that we are walking in him, that we are being built up in him. 
Because it says that even through toils, turns, and tough times, God is still with us. We still hear his voice. We still have his presence. And we still have the victory. That's a reason to be thankful. In fact, victory started for us when we said yes. So there's never not a time to stand with a victory chance. Because thankful is just who we are should be something that you do. Thankfulness and gratefulness and praise just praise ought to be God. who you are. We wouldn't have faith if Jesus wasn't victorious. We wouldn't have hope. We would, we would be tossed to and fro. We would still be without strength and without God. But God in his great love and in his mercy sent Jesus. And he gave us a reason to believe again. Yeah, you, you may have had hope all your life and never lost strength. He gave me a reason to believe again. He gave us a reason to believe again. He gave us the truth. Anybody ever been told a lie about yourself? You, you, you lied to yourself about who you are because of what you thought? I'm so thankful for God because he gave us his truth. He filled us with purpose. Anybody thought they were good for nothing? Somebody told you you'd never be anything? Yes. I'm thankful because he gave us purpose. And then he poured out his love into our hearts by way of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've ever felt unloved before. And because you felt unloved, you could never give real love. In fact, you ran for love because you wasn't sure what that looked like. But then God steps in and pours love into your hearts by way of the Holy Spirit. You can't be thankful for the truth. You can't be thankful because you have purpose. You can't be thankful because you have a God that sent you his love. But if you understand all of that about God, nothing else, you got to declare nothing else is going to do. This church had all of that. Somebody was trying to come in and give them what they thought was more, but it was really less. But they had to declare, nothing else is going to do. If I know my purpose now, and I have his truth, then I know what a lie looks like. I used to live the lie. We've got to declare that nothing else is going to do. Because anything else that I bring in is going to weaken my faith. And I'm working on being strengthened in the faith. So I can't hop here. I can't hop there. Right where I'm standing, I'm going to have to keep digging and digging and digging and digging and digging. Things still ain't changing, but I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to keep digging. I've been praying about this cancer for months. Keep digging. Keep digging. My marriage ain't got me better, but I'm going to keep digging. I'm going to keep digging. And the more I dig, the higher I grow. So while what's going on around me should look like it's taking me out, I look strong like the cedars in Lebanon. I look like I'm unstoppable. Y'all don't know how weak I am, but I feel strong at the same time because I'm digging. what I believe. Yes. I'm strengthening this conviction. I know what I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And based on what I believe, I got to be strengthened in this. We don't need any additions to the foundation that's already been laid. We don't need any renovations to that. <laughs> No add-ons, no substitutes, no fly-by-night, no short-lived substitutes. This is where I stand. Built up and rooted. And I'm going to stand here and be strengthened in the faith. God bless you. Oh,
that you ought to be thankful about that. But the weakest people in this room have been showing great strength in the worst seasons of their life. How is that possible? While things look like they just would come together and it seemed like everything was taken away from you and falling away. No one knew how deep your roots really were. You know, just because you see people crying, falling out a little bit, don't underestimate their roots. The reason why they, they can stand to cry and think about how they're going to make it another day. Because something or someone has to be holding them up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tears and stuff, that's just a sign of what's coming from without. That's normal. The breakdown is a sign of what's coming from without. But the fact that you're still standing is a sign of what's... these last and evil, extremely evil days. The people of God need to be standing. Now we're going to tell the world just trust God and lean on God. But they're still having a hard time with that. But if they see the man and the woman of God standing like a tree, they can show enough, lean on you. <laughs> And then ask you how you can still stand. And then you can tell them how you stand the way you do. And then they can receive faith for themselves. They got to see us standing. They have to see us being rooted. They have to see that we're not going to entertain stuff that's not about God. Things that are against God's word. We don't go with the flow. I don't care how good the flow looks. I don't care if there are laws built around the flow. <laughs> we still got to take a stand. Not Republican. Staying in democracy. We live under a theocracy. One nation under God. Ah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that's in this house, your liberating spirit, your strengthening spirit. We thank you for the power that's in this room. God, I pray for every weak person, anyone that's succumbed to additions, and at times a replacement to what they first received. I pray now in the name of Jesus of going back to what we first received. Not just having a foundation, but building on it, Father. Digging roots this time, saying, I'm going to stand for God no matter what. I'm going to stand for him. I'm going to be stronger. Everything that comes my way is going to have a hard time getting me to go down. Because I'm so rooted in Jesus Christ. The same temptations won't get me. The same things that I used to entertain in my ears won't get me. The things that I watch on TV will no longer get me. Because I'm going to deal with those things quickly and harshly. I'm going to stop headache-caking around things and, and people. And I, I let it go in a little bit. I'll stop dealing with them. Just give me some time. I want to let them down easy. While you're letting them down easy, you're going down quickly. This is about being stronger, not being weaker. Just as Paul wrote to deal with what was going on in this church. God, I pray that we'll take this word and deal with what's going on in our lives. And let nothing get away, get in the way. 
the foundation that has already been laid from the gospel that we received. The altar is open for prayer. Whatever you need, the altar is open for prayer. Maybe you feel convicted by this message. Maybe you're here today saying, I need to receive Jesus Christ. Winning Souls Evangelistic Church is one of the area's most dynamic churches, touching the lives of hundreds of people in Pasadena and the surrounding communities. We are a community full of energy, faith, and most importantly, people who want to serve God and one another. We're dedicated to being a place where you can believe, belong, and become all that God intends you to be. Winning Souls Evangelistic Church is committed to being a loving, healing fellowship where you can discover the abundance of life in Jesus Christ. Newcomers are extended a most cordial invitation to worship and unite with us. We extend an invitation for all to come and join us this Sunday at 10 a.m. for an anointed, powerful, and uplifting worship of God. Give us a call today for more information or visit us online.